Hey, welcome to Normandy Christian Church Online. My name is Kyle, I'm a pastor at Normandy Christian Church. And uh, we are today finishing, we're doing our last sermon in the book of Acts. And some of you might be going, yes, yeah, it's been a long series. Hopefully not, hopefully you have more of a, an appreciation for the book of Acts. And, but we started this in May and we've been going through the whole book and we can't help but to be reminded week in and week out of the mission. The mission being sharing Jesus' message of good news, of salvation everywhere we go, to all nations. That's the mission. That's what we need to be passionate about. That's what the book of Acts is about, the spread of Christianity. And so we pray that you not only know Jesus, but that you make him known. That, that, you, that God would give you boldness and, and love uh, to, to share that with, with other people. And uh, just a couple, couple things before we get started. We do have a community group that meets on Tuesday nights here at the church, and we have a Zoom Bible study on Thursday nights at 5.30. Uh, community group starts at 6.30. I don't know if I told you the time for that. And just for a couple more weeks, we're gonna be accepting donations for CareNet Pregnancy Centers. So again, thanks for, for joining us today. Let's pray as we get started in, in the message. God, uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your mission. We thank you for your church, God, that we can belong to. God, I, I just pray that we would understand what you want for us. God, we would understand uh, more about you, that we would understand your character, understand your mission, understand your love for us, God. And I pray that... God, that we would, with everything that we have, uh, God, that we would lean into you, that we would chase after you and want what you want uh, for our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so if you got a Bible, uh, turn to Acts 28, or if you're, you can use your phone, whatever you'd like. If you're watching this on Church Online platform, uh, there's a little tab you can even go to on that. So Acts 28. Starting, we're going to start with verse 17 in just a little bit. But uh, what an awesome book Acts is, right? It's, it's a part two of uh, uh, two, two books that were written by Luke. Luke wrote the book of the Gospel of Luke, which deals with Jesus' birth, his life and death and resurrection. And then Acts is a continuation. It's when, right when Jesus is getting ready to ascend to be with the Father. And he gives a mission. He, he gives the, the commands for his disciples to share the good news, to be witnesses uh, to, to all the world. So this is uh, what he says at the very beginning of the book of Acts. He says, I wrote this first narrative. I wrote the first narrative, which would have been the book of Luke, Theophilus. So he's writing to a guy named Theophilus about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up. So Luke is about what Jesus began to do and to teach. Acts would be what Jesus continues to do and to teach. And he does that through the, the apostles and through the church. Uh, I like, this is a, a, a title, instead of just the Acts uh, the book of Acts. What Acts? Whose Acts is it? And I, I, really, I really like this title for the book of Acts. It's the Acts of Jesus in the Holy Spirit through his apostles and in the church. So it's, it's Jesus doing, it's his mission, it's his Acts, and he's doing it in the Holy Spirit because Jesus ascended, he's with the Father, but we have the Holy Spirit with us, and we're continuing the mission um, that the apostles were doing and that the early church was doing. Just before Jesus ascended, he taught the disciples about the kingdom of God, and he gave them instructions to wait for the Holy Spirit who would empower them for the mission. So the mission that we're on to share the good news of Jesus is uh, we have all the resources we need to be able to share that. We have the Holy Spirit to help us do, do that. It's a little frightening, isn't it, to think about, I need to share the gospel with people. I need to, how do I bring that up? How do I, how do, I do that? Just understand that you're never alone, that God's with you. He's always with you. And he's gonna give you the words. He, he's gonna help you with words to say. And, and really, it isn't, it, it isn't, you saying the exact right words is going to bring someone to Christ. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
That's the power for salvation. And the gospel is, is this, that Jesus um, uh, would come and be our Savior. Savior from what? Well, we were created to be with God forever, right? We were created to have a relationship with Him forever. And we've sinned against God. Everyone has sinned against God. We've broken our relationship with God because we have decided to go our own way. We have decided to be the kings of our own life, uh, to lead our own lives. And that rebellion against God led to death, that we've, we're separated from God forever. And so we need a Savior. We need someone to bring us back, in, back into relationship with God, back into under the leadership of God who knows best how to, to run our lives. So Jesus came and he lived the perfect life. He showed us what the perfect human life uh, would, would be like. He perfectly fulfilled the law. He perfectly uh, did every command that God wants us to do. And he never sinned. And at the end of his life, at age 33, he gave his life on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. We deserve death because of our sins, but Jesus took the penalty for our sins by dying on the cross for us. But then he rose from the dead. So he, we don't worship a, a dead savior. We don't worship a, a, a religious leader who's dead. All the other religious leaders are dead. Jesus is, he's, he's the one who died and rose again. And he defeated sin. He defeated death by rising from the dead. And not only that, he, he gave us a mission. He gave us a commission, and that's to, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Share the good news that we do have a Savior. We do have a way to get back to the Father. And he ascended into, into uh, heaven. He ascended to be with the Father. He's preparing a place for us. And right now, he's reigning as King of kings and Lord of lords. Right now, as we're wondering what's going on with this world, this world is out of control. Um, God is reigning in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's reigning at the right hand of the Father. And he's, he's in control of everything. So that's, that's where he is. And he's getting ready to come back. We don't know when he's going to come back. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be a hundred years. But he's coming back. And when he comes back, he's going to put everything right again. He's going to bring his kingdom totally um, into, into this world. His kingdom's going to be uh, completely restored in this world. Well, God, he started restoring the kingdom when, when Jesus came into the world. Jesus was born a Jew, so Jesus is God, but he became a man, took on flesh. He was born a Jew, and he's the promised Jewish Messiah. He came so that not only the Jews, but that all the nations would be invited to live in his kingdom. The Apostle Paul is who we've been following the last half of the book of Acts. And we've been seeing some incredible journeys. Last week was a shipwreck that, that Paul was in. But this last half of the book of Acts, Paul was one of the main characters, or the main character. Um, he was a Jew who opposed Jesus. He didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. He didn't believe that he rose from the dead. And so he was opposed to Jesus. He was opposed to anyone who followed Jesus. He was, he was a persecutor of Christians. He wanted to squash Christianity. And, uh, and Jesus was opposed to him. He was opposed to, to Paul's plans. And so he put a stop to it. If God doesn't want something to happen, he's going to stop it. And we wonder why he doesn't stop more things today. But, but here with Paul, he, he put a stop to it. And not only did he put a stop to it, but he recruited Paul to be the greatest missionary that we've ever known. Paul wrote many books of the New Testament. He traveled throughout Asia Minor and Greece, spreading the good news of Jesus and starting churches. But the Jewish leaders were opposed to Paul because they were opposed to Jesus. So we continue, if you've been with us, we continue to see the Jewish leaders opposing Jesus or opposing Paul because he was preaching Jesus. They arrested him, they beat him, and they tried to kill him. And now at the end of Acts, Paul is in Rome as a prisoner 
waiting to be on trial with Caesar. And all this is because God promised he was going to bring him to Caesar. He was going to bring him to the city of Rome uh, so that he can proclaim Jesus as the true king. Uh, But Luke doesn't tell us. We look at the end of the book, which we're going to read in just a bit. Uh, We look at the end of the book. It doesn't tell us about Paul meeting Nero, who was Caesar at the time. He ends the book with Paul continuing to share the gospel. It's kind of like Acts ends with a to be continued. And that to be continued, it it seems like, man, did did we lose part of the book of Acts? Did it get lost in, uh, is it, you know, did we just not recover it? Because it just seems like there should be kind of a, what happened to Paul? But, but Luke's main point isn't what happened to Paul. Luke's main point is Jesus and the gospel, Jesus and his kingdom. And so the to be continued is uh, Acts 29. Now, there's no Acts 29 in, in your Bible, but I, I think what Luke's doing is saying that you and I are the Acts 29, that we're the continuation of the mission just because we don't, just because we just we see uh, Paul just kind of hanging out there, he's sharing the gospel. Um, what we're supposed to do, I believe, is is Luke wants us to see that okay, this is continuing with his church. You are to continue to do what Paul's doing. Let's look at the passage, uh, starting with verse seventeen. After three days. He, Paul, called together the leaders of the Jews. When they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors, I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. After they examined me, they wanted to release me, since there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. Because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, even though I had no charge to bring against my people. For this reason, I've asked to see you and speak to you. In fact, it is for the the hope of Israel that I'm wearing this chain. Then they said to him, We haven't received any letters about you from Judea. None of the brothers has come and reported or spoken anything evil of you. But we want to hear what your views are, since we know that people everywhere are speaking against this sect. So this sect meaning Jesus or uh, Christianity. So we, we aren't hearing great things about Christianity, but we want to hear from you. After arranging a day with him, many came to him at his lodging. From dawn to dusk, he expounded and testified about the kingdom of God. He tried to persuade them about Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets. So from... Oh, and let me read just the very end, verses 30 and 31. Paul stayed two whole years in his own rented house. And I'm not sure if that's really his rented house. That's how the Christian standard uh, translates that. But uh, at his own expense is really the, what the translation is. So in his own rented house, uh, whatever those accommodations was, he was still under arrest. Um, he welcomed... All who visited him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So from verse 30 on, Paul seems to live out the rest of his arrest um, at his own expense, but he's able to welcome visitors. People are able to come and he's able to share the gospel. He makes the most of the situation. I love this about Paul. We see this every week. By ministering, he's ministering to the Roman imperial guard. He's ministering to the Jews. He's ministering to anybody who will come and hear him. And this is my challenge for us, uh, my application for us, is we must make the most of every ministry opportunity. Instead of seeing how um, terrible things are or complaining about situations, what is the ministry opportunity that we have Uh, currently. Um, Look for what God's wanting us to do, not just our our own comforts or what we think is right or, you know, trying to, uh, you know, fight for our rights, but how can can I minister to other people? Um, 
Now in Philippians, uh, I want to read some, a passage that Paul wrote in Philippians. Philippians is one of what's called the, the prison letters that Paul wrote while he's in the Roman prison. And so he wrote this um, to the Philippians while he's in prison. And uh, if you're following along, it's Philippians 1, starting with verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel. So I'm in prison. This is a good thing for the gospel. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is because I, because I am in Christ. I love this. All the guards, everyone, uh, every, all of Caesar's guards know why Paul is there because he, he wants to make Jesus known. And he, Paul, he wouldn't be able to shut up about Jesus. He's got to keep talking about Jesus. Most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord from my imprisonment and dare even more to speak the word fearlessly. So because of Paul's imprisonment, he's encouraged other Christians to be more bold. It's like if Paul can do this and he can be bold even in prison, then I need to be more bold. To be sure, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. These preach out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, thinking that they will cause me trouble in my imprisonment. What does it matter? Only that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed. In this I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice because I know this will lead to, to my salvation through your prayers and help from the, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. My eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but that now, as always, with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death. I love it. Paul's perspective is, okay, I'm in prison. Let's make the best of this. I want Christ to be honored whether I'm, I get out of here or I stay here and die. And, and just the joy that he exudes. He, he talks about the joy that he has, that he's not ashamed of the gospel. Paul is making uh, the most out of this ministry opportunity. So he's here in Rome in, in prison, and he calls for the Jewish leaders. And he did this almost every city he went to. He, he would look for the Jewish leaders first. He would look for the, the synagogues in, in the cities. And uh, his belief was that the Jews need to hear this first because the message really came through, uh, the message of the gospel really came through the Jewish nation to be a blessing for all the nations. But it was Israel who was chosen to, to have the Messiah come through, through their nation. So he called the, Rome, uh, the Jewish leaders. He wanted to assure them that he's innocent, right? So he, he hasn't done anything wrong. And he would speak about the hope of Israel. The hope of Israel is that there would be a Messiah one day who would rescue his people, who would bring his kingdom uh, and, and put everything right. That was their hope. And Paul's saying, that's the hope I came for. That's the hope that I'm in chains for is because I'm talking about what God has promised to us. Uh, now, let me, now, let me read the middle section of Acts 28. I stopped at verse 23, but let me read 23 again and read to the end. After arranging a day with him, many came to him at his lodging. From dawn to dusk, he expounded and testified about the kingdom of God. He tried to persuade them about Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets. So he's talking about Jesus and the kingdom from the Old Testament. That was their scriptures. Some were persuaded by what he said, but others did not believe. Disagreeing among themselves, they began to leave after Paul made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your ancestors through the prophet Isaiah when he said, Go to these people and say, You will always be listening, but never understanding. You will always be looking, but never perceiving. For the hearts of these people have grown callous. Their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. 
And then let me read those two verses again that he ends with. Paul stayed two whole years in his own rented house, and he welcomed all who visited him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So Paul taught about the kingdom of God. It's it's two main things that he's teaching about is the kingdom of God and the king. So the kingdom of God has a king, and that is King Jesus. Paul used scriptures to point to him. He would have pointed to uh, the things that they knew, the the sacrificial system, the temple, uh, the priests, the kings, everything, the prophets, everything in the Old Testament was pointing to Jesus, was pointing to the fact that that Jesus would come and save us. Here, um, they were in Rome in the same city as Lord Caesar, and Caesar would have been called Lord. Uh, But Paul taught about the true Lord, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, and King Jesus. King, uh, Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. One of the things, I, here's what I want to challenge you with next, is not only um, making the most of every ministry opportunity, but that those ministry opportunities need to be about teaching all people about the king and the kingdom. We need to be specifically speaking to people about Jesus and his kingdom. That's what Paul did. Paul's talking about Jesus' kingdom, and he's putting that up against uh, the Roman kingdom. And with the Jews, he's really putting that up against their kingdom. So they, their, their religion became their kingdom. And uh, so they didn't, they didn't believe Jesus was the king. He didn't, they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They thought there was going to be some other kind of kingdom. And so Paul's preaching about Jesus being the kingdom, uh, being the king. Um, it's not like his, Jesus' kingdom is not like the kingdoms of this world. The kingdoms of this world are about me. The kingdoms of this world are about power. The, the kingdoms of this world are about um, wealth and, and money. Uh, but Jesus' kingdom is about serving. It's about loving. It's about looking for uh, those who are poor, looking for those who are outcasts, looking for those who are forgotten. That's what Jesus' kingdom is about. It's about humility, not trying to be first, but trying to be last, trying to to serve and making sure that that we're taking care of other people. Now, does that sound like what most people are living for today? Not to me. It seems like today people are living for me, 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 me. I want to make sure that I'm being taken care of. I want to make sure that people like me. I want to make sure uh, that... that, um, I have my needs met. And what's sad is that many Christians try to serve earthly kingdoms over Jesus' kingdom. Um, It's easy to do that. It's easy to to think, well, this is where we belong and and we need to put all our efforts into this kingdom, uh, whether it's a a national kingdom or or whatever that, that kingdom is, that we would make this earth um, our home, that we would make it our, the place that we long for. It isn't. It's Jesus' kingdom. Jesus' kingdom is what we long for. Jesus' kingdom is where, where we're headed, right? This, these kingdoms, the earthly kingdoms, uh, aren't going to be around very long. They're very temporary. God's kingdom is about Jesus, King Jesus reigning in the hearts of those who come to Him and surrender to His Lordship. We need to give up our agenda. We need to give up our uh, kingdom, our way of life, and embrace Jesus' kingdom. Those who belong to King Jesus are going to show the world what the king is like. So if, if you're a Christian, one of your jobs is to live in such a way so that people would see your life and go, that's what Jesus is like. It's pretty daunting, isn't it? But understand that the Holy Spirit is helping you do that. It isn't, it isn't making much of yourself, it's making much of Jesus, speaking of Jesus. In fact, um, you're, you're kind of just staying in the background. You're, staying, you're helping other people succeed. You're, you're serving other people. You're not making it about yourself. I want to ask you, how do you think we're doing as a church? At Normandy, how do you think we're doing? As a church uh, worldwide, how do you think we're doing at showing what Jesus is like? What do people who don't know Jesus think 
that he's like just by watching the church. We should be giving a foretaste of what the kingdom that's coming, when Jesus comes again, his kingdom's going to come in total, right? It's going to be, uh, it's, everything's going to be made right again. We need to be living in such a way that that kingdom is already here. So are we giving a foretaste of that kingdom when Jesus returns? Paul was trying to persuade the Jews of the truths of Jesus and the kingdom. He's, he is a Jew. He cared for the Jews. He wants them so badly to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Some were persuaded. Now, it doesn't mean that they became Christians. It's just they were persuaded with what Paul was saying. When we share the gospel, it's, it's important to persuade them that this is true, but people need to make a personal decision. People need to decide, I'm going to make him my Lord and Savior. Savior. Actually, that I'm going to let him be Lord and Savior. Because you don't make Jesus anything. You allow him to be Lord and Savior of your life. You choose for him to be your Lord and Savior. Um, so some were persuaded, but they still needed to repent and believe. Paul cited the prophet Isaiah who talked about hearing and seeing and the heart. And what Isaiah was saying is, is there's going to be there's going to be people hearing but not really understanding. There's going to be people seeing but not perceiving. There's going to be people that uh, turn away the message of, of God, turn away the message of the gospel, and their hearts are going to become callous, and they'll never be able to turn to him. I want to encourage you with something is if you've never made the decision for Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, to surrender to him and let him lead your life, do it now. If at all you've ever considered that, because if you keep putting it off, what happens is pretty soon you're going to not really care anymore. But there has to be a point in time where you just say, Jesus, I want you to run my life. Jesus, you are Lord. You are King. Would you be Lord and King of my life? So Paul's just quoting from Isaiah, but he's saying, this, this is you. By quoting that, he's saying, this is you. Many of you, you're hearing the message, but you're not, you're not listening. You're not even trying to understand. You're not opening up your heart to the possibility of this. And so you won't receive it. It's a rejection, right? It's we either receive the gospel or we reject the gospel. You receive Jesus or you reject Jesus. That's everyone in the world. There's not just a, I'm okay with the gospel. There's not a third way. There's only two ways. By, by just staying neutral is to reject the gospel, is to reject Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So... Sadly, in this passage, the Jews heard Paul's message about Jesus, but many refused to respond to it. Paul usually started sharing with the Jews when, in the cities he went to. Then, when they refused, he went to the Gentiles. And that's what he's saying here in this passage is, all right, salvation is now going to be brought to the Gentiles. He wanted to give the Jews in Rome the first chance to hear. And not that the, the gospel was already in Rome. There was already a church in Rome, but he's, he's now going to be focusing on the Gentiles. The, the Jews have, you know, it isn't that he gave up. I'm sure it, when he had the opportunities, he would share with the Jews. But his focus, his main focus was going to be on the Gentiles. See, the, the gospel is good news for all the nations, not just for some nations. The gospel is, a good, is good news for, for United States it's good news for Myanmar. It's good news for Haiti. It's good news for India. It's good news for North Korea. It's good news for Iran. It's good news for Israel. The gospel is the good news for all nations. His kingdom is a multi-ethnic international kingdom. It was always meant to be that. In, in the book of Revelation, we see when everyone is gathered around the throne, when we get to be in, in the new kingdom, there, is rep, there are representatives from all the nations and all the people groups that are joined together. Isn't that awesome? We don't know who's going to be receptive, but our job is to share the gospel with whoever we can, whoever's going to, to listen. And if someone isn't going to listen, um, find someone who's going to be more receptive. 
It doesn't mean that you just give up on them. Pray for them. Uh, but there are going to be people that are going to be more receptive. Throughout his imprisonment and all his ministry, Paul talked about the king and the kingdom. Luke said that he did it with all boldness and without hindrance. Though Paul was chained, so Paul was imprisoned, but the gospel wasn't. Paul was, was hindered at times, but the gospel never was. In fact, the, the gospel can't be hindered. The gospel can't be imprisoned. It can't be in chains. Don't fear persecution. I think, you know, we, we hear, it's like someday we might be having persecution. Don't fear that. Don't fear what the world can do in limiting the church. You know, sometimes like, is government going to shut down the church? The government couldn't possibly shut down the church because it's Jesus' church. They, they can't, no force can shut down the gospel because the gospel is going to go out. It's, it's going to be effective. Listen to, what, um, listen to what Isaiah says, or God says in Isaiah 55. So my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. Don't you love that? Is we, don't, we don't need to hope that God's word is going to be effective. It's going to be effective. We just need to proclaim the gospel. And a lot of times just get out of the way, right? Just share the gospel and just get out of the way and let God work. There have been times where, um, I don't know if I'm getting off on a rabbit trail or not, I just thought of this. Um, but there have been times where after preaching, someone will come up to me and go, man, that was great. Here's what I got out of it. And what they said they got out of it was nothing what I shared, right? But, but what was happening is that God was using His Word and bringing something that they needed to hear. And it wasn't about exactly what I said. It was about, it was about God's Word being effective and doing something. So I want to encourage you with something. As we share the gospel, sometimes we're going to feel like, man, I didn't get to share this, or I should have said this, or man, I can't. Let, let God, let God convict. Let God do His work in salvation. Paul was beaten and arrested in Jerusalem. So this was after being in, in uh, Asia Minor and in Greece. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at when he, he went back down to Jerusalem. He was beaten and arrested. He went through several trials. Uh, he's in prison in Caesarea for a couple of years. Um, he had people wanting to take him out, like not, not out uh, to movies or something, but like take his life out. They wanted to kill him. Um, but he nearly drowned in the Mediterranean. We saw that last week in, in the, the shipwreck. And then even when that didn't happen and he survived that, the soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners, which Paul was one of the prisoners. Uh, and then they, they didn't. He was saved from that. And then he was bitten by a poisonous snake. And God uh, kept him alive through that. But it wasn't the forces of nature that were trying to stop Paul. The wind wasn't trying to stop Paul. It, the wind is just a force of nature, right? A snake, uh, this, wasn't, this wasn't Satan uh, posing himself as a snake. This was just a snake. Uh, the snake wasn't trying to stop Paul from sharing the gospel, the Jews, even though they were trying to uh, stop Paul from sharing the gospel, it really wasn't about them either. It, it's not about them. It's not about the snake or the, or the wind or anything that would hinder us from sharing the gospel. What's really going on is there are demonic forces that are using these things to try to stop the gospel. They, do it, they did it with Paul. They do it with us. There really is a spiritual reality. And I want, I want to, here's what we're going to be doing. So you go, what's going to go on? We just finished the um, sermon series on Acts. Well, for the next six weeks, we're going, to be do, we're going to be doing a study on spiritual warfare. And we're going to be looking at one of Paul's prison letters, the book of Ephesians, specifically Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. We're going to focus in on that. But we're going to look at... Uh, 
the spiritual warfare that's going on and how, to sta- how can we stand firm in troubling times? How can we stand firm and not get beaten down? And how can we make sure that, that we're getting ministry done and, and, and serving in His name and getting the gospel out and not failing as a Christian, right? So just not, not just surviving, but growing as a Christian. How, how is that going to happen? Well, um, Paul wants us to know and wants to remind us we're in a spiritual war. And there are demonic forces that are against us. That's what was going on with Paul. Um, but here's what, here's what we're going to see. Just a spoiler alert. The battle is already won. right? When Jesus died on the cross and he rose again from the dead, he defeated Satan and demons. There's, there's nothing they can do that hurts you, to hurt you if you are a believer. If you haven't trusted in Jesus, you're, you're in cahoots with Satan. Let me put it just as bluntly as that, is there's only two kingdoms. There's there's God's kingdom and there's Satan's kingdom, and you choose who you want to follow. There's There's no middle kingdom or not a kingdom. There's God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. So I want to, with like Paul did, with everything that I have, I want to persuade you, I want to encourage you to accept Jesus, to say yes to Jesus if you've never done that before. And Christian, the battle's won. So we don't have to fear the demonic. We have to be aware of that and not participate in the demonic. So um, in that great passage in Ephesians 6, um, Paul asks people to pray that he would have boldness to share the gospel. Isn't that incredible? Paul, the Apostle Paul, prays for boldness. I just thought he had it naturally. I thought he was just bold all the time. But he's going, hmm, I need to, I'm a little little frightened. I have a little fear in me and and I, I need boldness. Would you please pray for that for me? If the Apostle Paul needs prayer for boldness, I need prayer for boldness. You could pray for me. If you're going, hey, what can I, what can I pray for today? Just go, hey, Kyle uh, would like prayer for boldness. So you could pray for me. I'll pray for you. Uh, let's, let's pray for each other that we're bold with the gospel, that we wouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. Paul says in, in Romans 1 that I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. It's, it's the gospel that is the power. Uh, Paul was in, was in house arrest for two years. That's all that Luke writes. It seems through other writings, Luke doesn't write this, but it seems through other writings that he was released around A.D. 62 or 63. We think he traveled some more as he shared the gospel. He possibly even got to Spain. We don't know if he he got there or not. He was arrested again about A.D. 67. And according to, to tradition, was beheaded in Rome by the emperor Nero. It was while he was waiting for his execution, while he was in prison again, that he wrote 2 Timothy. And I want to read a passage from 2 Timothy that Paul's writing to uh, young Timothy, his, his son in the faith. And uh, listen, listen to uh, a man who's in prison, knowing that he's, he's going to die any time. He says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time for my departure is close. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. There is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but to all those who loved his appearing. At my first defense, no one stood by me, but everyone deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that I might fully preach the word and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil work and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Don't you love that? I I love what he says there. The Lord delivered Paul safely to Rome, and the Lord was going to deliver him safely to his eternal home. That's what he's going to do for us. We can count on it. 
So until we see the king, until we see him, like when, when we die, or if we get to see him come, come again, we get to see his coming, that would be amazing to see Jesus come back. Let's pour out our lives like Paul did and go, what should my life be about? If that's where we're headed, if we're going to be in this eternal kingdom that he's bringing me, it's like I'm already there, right? Uh, I already have salvation because of Jesus Christ. All those who have trusted in Jesus Christ and follow him, you have salvation already. So if that's where we're headed, look at your life now, kind of reverse engineer your life. That's where we're headed. That's where we're going to be. Now look at your life and go, is what I'm doing, is it makes sense that I'm going to be with Jesus forever? Is how I'm living my life showing that I believe that? Or is it showing that I'm trusting in the worldly kingdom, in, in what's going on here? What am I most concerned about? Where am I spending my money? Where am I spending my time? Uh, what do I, what, what am I training myself for most? Is it for the temporal kingdom of this world? Or is it not only so that he'll be pleased with me, when I get to heaven, I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. But how many people can I bring with me? How many men, women, boys and girls can I bring with me uh, to that kingdom? Keep fighting. Like Paul says, keep fighting, keep running the race. The book of Acts continues with us. There's an Acts 29. Again, it's not in your, it's not in your Bible, but we're the Acts 29. What's your verse going to look like? If, if, if Acts was written, if Luke were to continue it out and he were to list our names, what would your verse look like? What do you want that to look like? Live your life now knowing that it's all about the king and the kingdom. Trust in Jesus today. If you've never trusted in Jesus, today's the day of salvation. Today's the day I want to encourage you to drop your pride, to drop your agenda, drop your kingdom, and let him be your king. Let him be your Lord. We're going to have a time now it, it just, that we set aside it at the end, and it's, it's really what I think is the, the most important part of our getting together, and that's remembering his death on the cross. And we do that by, by observing the Lord's Supper, what he uh, wanted us to do when we get together. And it's taking some bread and, and some juice, uh, just something, a cracker, and, and you know, some liquid that you can take and just remember his death on the cross. The king, Jesus who is the king, Jesus who is the creator, stepped off his throne and he, he put aside his rights and put aside his privileges and took the form of a servant. And he became a man. And he served us by, by taking this, ultimately he served us by taking our sins upon the cross so that we can be forgiven and that we can enjoy the kingdom with the king. That's what we celebrate. So I encourage you at this time to take communion with your family or if you're on your own, just, just do that on your own. Uh, but spend time now just thanking the king uh, that he has invited you and he's invited everybody into his kingdom. Let's pray. God, thank you for the book of Acts. Uh, we are so blessed to have, um, have the, the book of Acts in the Bible. If, if it weren't, were not there, we would be missing so much. And so God, I thank you in your providence and your sovereignty that you made sure that the book of Acts was there for our benefit, not just for information, but for transformation, that you're changing us because of of what happened in the book of Acts. God, thank you that it's not just a book of history that happened in the past. This is real, uh, this is real life that's going on now that continues to go on. God, we pray that we would be your faithful Acts 29, that we would be faithful in sharing the gospel. God, thank you for, uh, just thank you for the opportunities you gave us this last week and that we were able to see and we were able to pray with people or share with people. God, I thank you for what you're doing. Would you please give us boldness, give us the words uh, to share. God, I, I'm so thankful for this congregation. God, I thank you that even, even though we're separated, 
uh, a lot of times uh, we're not here physically, God, that we are part of this huge um, organization called your church that's worldwide. And God, we're so thankful for salvation that you have given uh, for every nation, for every people group. God, give us that same passion. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.